From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Harry Branson at Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Oh, hi, Harry. What's on your mind? I have a case for you, a very important one. Good. Tell me about it. John, did you ever hear of Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscoat? Lord, who... Say that slowly, will you? Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscoat. Sorry, I left my kilts and bagpipes on the other side of the drink. Huh? Oh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm feeling real sharp this morning. But what about this Laird Douglas Douglas something or other? Uh, can you come down here to Philadelphia and see me? I hate to be so blunt about it, old boy, but what's in it for me? A nice retainer fee in any event. Well, good. And, of course, expenses and your regular commission if anything happens to Laird Douglas Douglas. Of Heatherscoat. Uh, why, yes. Okay, Harry, I'm on my way. Oh, oh John. Yeah? Uh, come down by plane, will you? The first one you can get. Urgent, huh? Yes, John. Very. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Harry Branson at the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscoat matter, whoever Laird Douglas Douglas is, and whether investigation is the proper term at this point, who knows. In any event, well... Expense account item one, 2250, air transportation and miscellaneous, Hartford to New York to Philadelphia. For a change, I decided to stay at the Benjamin Franklin, not only because it was convenient to Harry Branson's office on Walnut Street, that is, the office of Philly Mutual Liability and Casualty, but because I'd heard it was a nice hotel. It was. And it was convenient to everything else in the center of town. Theaters, good restaurants, nice stores, even a nightclub. Well, anyhow, when I got to my room, I found a half dozen urgent messages that Harry had called. Pretty good indication that his lordship, Douglas Douglas, of, or at least this case, was pretty important. So instead of bothering to unpack, I had the bellboy dump my luggage, tipped him, and was standing there debating whether I'd better forego a quick shower and change of clothes when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. John, didn't you get my messages? Why haven't you called? I've been waiting to hear from you. What's wrong? Hey, take it easy, Harry. I just this minute got in. Oh. Well, I hope you're coming right on over here to my office. Well, what's the matter? Something happened to this client of yours? No, not yet. But being you, you're expecting the worst, huh? And look, you still haven't told me a thing about this emergency or whatever you want to call it. John, it is an emergency because of the time element. You see, oh, why do we waste time on the phone? Well, this was your call, not mine. All right, all right, I'm sorry. I'll be waiting for you. And Harry, I'll be there. Still knowing nothing whatsoever about what was going on, I decided I'd better be prepared for anything. So I slipped the 38 Colt out of my bag and took it along. Expense account item two, 65 cents, cab fare. I've said it before when I handled the Amerigo case for him. Harry Branson is a good insurance man, but a worry wart. So I kind of hoped he was making the usual mountain out of the usual molehill this time. However, when my cab pulled up in front of his office building, he was standing waiting on the sidewalk out front. Hey, I keep the change. Thank you, sir. John, John, what took you so long? Huh? Thank goodness you're here. Harry, what are you doing out here? Lose your office or just forget the key? I almost wish I had. John, we have a problem. A serious one. Yeah, with Laird Douglas, Douglas of, uh... Heatherscoat, Heatherscoat. He's up in my office yeah, now. Sounds like international intrigue. Has Scotland declared war on us or something? This is no time for levity. He's up in the office now and you must take over immediately. This is a very serious situation. Come. Okay. Oh, now, what's it all about? Has Laird Douglas died and... Oh, no, no, you said he was up in your office. And I'm sure you don't mean just his body. Yes, he's there with Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. Kelly Van... Huh? Are you kidding? I certainly am not. You see, she insists that you act as his bodyguard. Oh, now, wait a minute, Harry. Unfortunately, or rather fortunately for you... 13th floor, please. Yes, sir. Unfortunately, I said 13th floor, operator. Please, quickly. Yes, sir. So, Harry? Unfortunately... Young man, will you please start this elevator immediately? Gotta wait for the signal, sir. Signal? This is an emergency. Take off! Immediately! Emergency? Yes, it involves Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope. Oh, well, sure, if it's... Who? Good man, good man. <sighs> okay. Now, you were saying, Harry... Uh, was I? Uh, unfortunately something. 
Oh, oh, yes, of course. Fortunately for you, she was quite cognizant of the fact... Who was cognizant? Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. She knew about the excellent work you did for us in connection with the Ricardo Amerigo case not long ago. Excellent detective work, she called it. 13th floor. You remember the case, Ricardo, the concert violinist who disappeared, presumably. Yeah, murdered. I remember. And your almost intuitive deduction that he wasn't dead at all, but had merely staged the whole thing to make it uh, look as the... Harry. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes, of course. 13th floor. You mean uh, Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van... Excuse me, mister, but I'm getting signals from the other floors. You're quite right, you should. As I started to say, John... She is one of our biggest personal policy holders. Good, good. But uh, hadn't we better get into your office and meet her? Oh, yes, yes. But I want you to know about the personal premiums. Alone, they run to something over $20,000 a year. Mr. Please. Well, she is an important client. Yes, yes. And that's why I Mr. didn't... Mr. Williams, I didn't please? hesitate to accede to her request that you be called in on this case. I called you and here you are. Mr. Please. Hmm? Oh, well, get us up to the... Th oh, oh, we're here. Why didn't you tell us? Come, John. Mister, if I was to tell you what I'd like to, I'd... My office is right this way, John. Come, please. Hey, look, you better calm down, Harry, and give me the dope on this case right from the beginning. Yes. Yes, I'd better. All right. Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten is a very important client, has been for years. So you said. But there are a lot of things you haven't said, like... Uh... What has she got to do with this Laird Douglas character, and why is he so important? It's this way, John. The policy on him runs to $5,000. No double indemnity, which is good. As a matter of fact, the policy on him was purely a favor to Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten. You know, considering such short life expectancy and all. No, I don't know. Is he in his dotage or something? Well, hardly. Or are you being facetious again? But you said... Hey, how old is he? His birthday is next month, May 7th to be exact. He'll be four years old. Hip four? That's right. Short life expectancy? Of course, you see, John. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, some horrible disease or something, huh? What's the matter with him? John, you wanted this from the beginning, so I'll give it to you from the beginning. Okay, but Harry... If it you're... hadn't been for Mrs. Van Pyten's own policies totaling something in the neighborhood of half a million, uh, more in fact... Harry... Why, we'd never have written the one on Lord Douglas Douglas of Heatherscoat. So, now we've cleared that up. Harry, we passed your office three or four doors ago. Hmm? Oh, yes. Yeah. But uh, as I'm sure you understand, I wanted to give you some of the background before you talk with Mrs. Van Pyten. After all, you asked for it. Yes, yes, I guess I did. But uh, what you've given me so far has landed me smack dab in the Department of Utter Confusion. And I'm beginning to think maybe I have company. Oh, where? Who? Right here. You, Harry. Now, look. Why don't we quietly stroll into your office and let me get the whole thing from Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten herself? Or better still, from Laird Douglas Douglas. But you couldn't. Of course not. What? At least not from him. Oh, why not? John, will you please stop joking? Who's joking? This is serious business, very. <sighs> Look, Harry. Yes? There is one thing I'd like to talk over before we go in to see him. Them, somebody. Yes? Well, apparently the life and or welfare of this Laird Douglas Douglas is in danger. Oh, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. I thought I'd made that very clear to you. Yeah, well, you said you've written only a $5,000 policy on him. That's right, $5,000. And purely yeah, as a... Yeah, 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 I know all about that. Now, look, I don't want to seem crass about it, Harry, but my commission, if anything were to happen to him, wouldn't amount to a hill of beans. Which is precisely why I told you you will be paid a retainer while you're on the case. A most generous one. A generous one? By you? By Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten. How much? Well, John, <clears throat> now mind you, this may not require your services for more than a week or so. As bodyguard, that is. How much? And, of course, she has authorized an expense account. Ah. But, mind you, John, not the usual kind that you seem to have the knack of piling up beyond all reason. Clearly, a completely honest, legitimate accounting... Harry, that... how much? But as a matter of cold fact... I have assured her that it will total no more than the amount of the retainer she is prepared to pay you. Any more than that, and, uh, well, you'll have a lot of explaining to do. Harry, how much is this retainer to be, if I take the case? I might even go so far. $750 per week, or a fraction thereof, and I am sure you will agree that that... What's the matter, John? $750 a week, plus expenses, when there's only a $5,000 policy involved? That's right. But if this four-year-old Laird Douglas Douglas of... of, of, of Heather Scott. Yeah. If he's only worth a $5,000 policy, what was that crack about short life expectancy? John, I told you he is already four years old. He, 
Oh, look, start all over again, will you, Harry? Yes. No, on second thought, perhaps you were right. Perhaps you'd better get the details directly from Mrs. Peter Malcolm, Malcolm Kelly, Kelly Van Pyten. I know. Now, look, Harry, I, I think I'd better. I'd better get it from somebody. You're Incidentally, not... John, you understand, of course, that your services will be required only during the affair at Bala Kinwood. And not one minute no, thereafter. No, I don't understand. What's Bala Kinwood? Out around Westchester, outside the city, one of the suburbs. Very nice suburb, too. That is where Leia Douglas Douglas... <sighs> I've had this coat. Yes, John, that is where he will appear. And you or Mrs. Kelly Van Pyden, or both, if you think his life will be in danger. Exactly. Oh, John, I knew you were just joking me all the time. I wish I knew. Uh, <clears throat> here we are, and everything will be clear. Yeah. Oh, thank heavens, dear Mr. Branson. I was afraid something had happened to you. You were gone so long, you really had me quite worried. Oh, I'm so sorry, but I had hoped to tell Mr. Dollar something of this affair, and I'm afraid we loitered on the way up. Uh, Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten, this is Mr. John Dollar. Oh, you wonderful, wonderful man. I'm so glad that you've agreed to take on this assignment. You see, Laird Douglas Douglas means everything to me. And I have the utmost confidence in you. I'm sure Laird Douglas will, too. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, but where is he? Uh, why, yes, Mrs. Van Pyten, what's happened to him? Oh, don't worry, don't worry, my dear. He's all right. But after all, he is so temperamental. I fear he got a bit impatient waiting for you. And I know you'll forgive him. You will, won't you? Yes, yes, of course, but where is he? He's asleep, Mr. Branson, in your inner office. He sat down in your chair and fell fast asleep. Oh, if I could only relax that way. But you must meet him, Mr. Dollar. Yes, I'd certainly like to. Of course you would, and I know he'll want to meet you. Gently now. Oh, good, he's awake. Oh, no. That's Laird... Laird Douglas, Douglas of Heatherscote. This is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Hey, oh, John! Hey, Douglas, Douglas, no! Somebody. Let go of Mr. Dollar's leg! Douglas, dear! Douglas! Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's, uh, intriguing? Well, tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, I've handled some pretty doggy cases in my time, but never as a pooch's bodyguard. But suddenly this one begins to smell much too strongly of murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ray Rowland. Oh, hi, Ray. Just got your message. What are you doing in Philadelphia? Oh, a case for Philly Mutual Liability and Casualty, and I may need your help. What do you know about Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote? Why, he's one of Scotland's finest. Wait a minute. That's your case? Yep. Insurance? And bodyguard. How's about lunch? Johnny, have you met the... Have you met his lairdship? Yeah, and I nearly lost a leg doing it. Oh. Then you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, shut up. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company, in connection with my investigation, or rather my involvement in the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote matter. And I wish I'd had some idea of what I was getting into before I ever left Hartford. But it's too late now. Expense account item three, $39.50. One pair of slacks. For within a few minutes of my arrival in Philadelphia, Harry Branson of Philly Mutual buttonholed me and dragged me up to his office to meet two important clients he had. First was Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. Oh, you wonderful, wonderful man. I am so glad that you've agreed to take on this assignment. Laird Douglas Douglas means everything to me, and I have the utmost confidence in you. I'm sure Laird Douglas will, too. And then came... Well, Mrs. Van Pyten made the introduction. Laird 
Blair Douglas Douglas of Hedderscoat. This is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Huh? Oh, no. Oh, oh, Holy oh, jump Douglas, of the... Douglas, oh, no, you mustn't do that. Oh, my. Douglas, oh, dear, dear, good heavens. Get on oh, your own Douglas, chair, Harry. This no, one's taken. No. Sorry, John, sorry. Down, Douglas, down. Oh. There, dear, that's the boy. That's a nice boy. That yes, is now. Laird Douglas Douglas of Hedderscoat? Yes, isn't he adorable? He's so playful. He was really just playing, you know. There, dear, come now. Harry. Yes, John? This yes, is the client you call me all the way down from Hartford to see? Yes, John, yes. 750 a week, practically unlimited. Expense account. Oh, dear, just look at your trousers, Mr. Dollar. I don't need to, thanks. I can feel the draft. But you'll need new ones. Here. And I insist you let me pay for it. Down, oh, Douglas, oh, oh, oh. down. Here, Mr. Dollar. Will a hundred dollars be enough? Uh, he. No, here, a hundred and fifty. I can see those were very, very nice. Well, uh, you see what I mean, John? Here, please. Now, I insist you take it. And if it isn't no, enough... No, 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 thanks. That's plenty. But now, Harry, you listen to John, me. John, I know what you're going to say, but as I explained to you on the way up you to my office... You explained plenty, but not nearly enough. But I tried. I really tried. I think boys. you and I had better have a quiet little talk, Harry, and the sooner the better. Oh, boys, please, can't you do that another time? Please come down from those chairs so Mr. Dollar can meet Douglas and we can make all the arrangements. Please? Mrs. Van Pyten, that's precisely what I want to talk about. <laughs> you really look very funny up there. And see, Douglas does want so much to be friends with you. Yeah, you're sure it isn't a piece of my leg he wants. Oh, no, of course not. Here, Mr. Dollar, just give him one of these biscuits. I have them specially baked for him. And he'll be your friend for life. Really? Huh? Here, now just come down and hand it to him. Well, He'll love you. It's true, John, I know. Yeah? Then what are you doing up on that chair? I I forgot, that's all. Nice, Douglas. Huh? Please, Mr. Dollar. Well, hey, oh, all I hope is he doesn't forget. That's right. Just hand it and to him. And then he knows which is biscuit and which is my hand. Yo, uh, here, boy. Here, boy. Now, take it easy, take it easy. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, there you see. Now he's your friend, well, isn't that sweet? Yeah, yeah, sure is. Well, well, I'd better get back to my hotel and change it. Harry, I'll call you. Oh, but we haven't made the definite arrangements yet, and I want you staying out at our place in Germantown, the Maples. It's a lovely little place, Mr. Dollar. Well, much as I hate to say it, I'm, I'm not quite sure about taking oh, this Oh, I know. The money. Well, don't you worry about it. Not at all, not one bit. If you'd rather have $1,000 a week, that's what we'll make it. And I do wish Mrs. you'd let Van me Pyton. do more about these poor trousers. I know. Why don't you go straight over to Wanamaker's Men's Store and have them tailor you a whole suit? Wouldn't that be nice? You'd look lovely. You've in... already given me more than enough oh, to buy us. A... that. Now, just forget it. Now, you have them make you anything you want and just charge it to me. Oh, and look! Douglas Deere is licking your hand. I knew he'd like you. Never underestimate the power of a woman, somebody once said. Or maybe they should have said never underestimate the power of a fast buck or a thousand bucks. Anyhow, Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten had set her heart on my handling this whole affair, and she simply wasn't to be denied. Couple that with a chance to pick up enough loot in a few days to, uh... Well, what would you do? And the darn mutt did take a liking to me. So, with Laird Douglas Douglas in my lap... Oh, he's a Scotty, by the way. Scottish Terrier, Mr. Dollar. If you'll pardon my correcting you. Sorry. And it's all because of the show at Bala Kinwid on Friday. Bala where? Uh, B-A-L-A-C-Y-N-W-Y-D, John. Yes, Bala Kinwid. Laird Douglas Douglas simply must win. Not only best of class, but best of show. And he will if somebody doesn't interfere. Oh, you uh, you think somebody might uh, might do something to, to uh, Douglas? Here? I'm sure of it, because it's been tried before. You mean poison him or something like that? Worse. Oh? Dope. Poison would let him die a hero, a martyr. But drugs would keep him from winning the show. Oh, yeah. Well, what makes you suspect somebody might try it? As I said, it's been tried before. Huh? Last year and again a few days ago. And if Harrison R. Kenworthy thinks he can do it again, he's mistaken. Then you know who did it before. I refuse to divulge any names. But you just said... Mr. That... Dollar, I will not tell you. All I ask is that you watch over Laird Douglas Douglas until he has won the show. Oh, and if he does win, as I'm sure he will, 
I'll insist that you accept a nice bonus. So you can see, I'm very, very serious. And so it went on for another half hour or so. And finally she left, after I'd promised to pick up my bags at the hotel and move out to her joint in fashionable Germantown. I talked a few minutes longer with Harry Branson. I'm so glad you've agreed to take this on, John. As I told you, Mrs. Van Pyten is the most important individual policyholder we have, and doing this favor Harry, for Harry, us... it's not the Mutt Show at Bala Kinwood or Laird Douglas or Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten or you I'm doing this for. It's purely love of the green stuff. Whew. That old dame must be really loaded. John, she has so much money. She, well, she doesn't know how much she has. Industrial empire, that sort of thing. All right, all right. But Harry... If word ever gets around in the trade that I came down here to play bodyguard to a mutt, so help me, I'll have your head. <clears throat> yes. Uh, but now, hadn't you better go on out to the Maples? Well, first I want to know about this Harrison R. Kenworthy she mentioned. Oh, that. Yeah, that. She accused him of doping up her Scotty. Well, she really doesn't know, and it, it's really quite complicated. What do you mean? Kenworthy owns a beautiful Kerry Blue Terrier, Lady Odetti's Rolla Mame. Lady o Holy cats, and no pun. Why can't they give an honest dog an honest name? Look, we'll call her Mimi. Go ahead. Hi, dog lovers. Ray, just in time. Meet Harry Branson, Ray Rowland. Oh, we know each other. Hello, Harry boy. Mr. Rowland. Sure, Harry called me in last year when these two dogs were at each other's throats. Of course, throat. he doesn't mean that literally, John. You see, Mr. Rowland is quite an authority on show animals. I've held it against him for years, ever since school. Well, there's no need to hold it against him, and particularly. And I don't mean that literally. Oh. Well, John boy, so you came down to help yourself to a handful of dear Mrs. Kelly Vian Python's coin. More power to you. I knew Harry would call you in on the case. Felt it in my bones. And, brother, you may be in deeper than you think. Oh? What's that supposed to mean, Ray? Has Harry told you about the villain of the piece, Harrison R. Kenworthy? I was just starting to when you so rudely... Yeah, me. well, Johnny, the whole setup is a riot, but just remember one thing. Yeah? A lot of people have been killed in riots. Now, what's that supposed to mean? I'll tell you what he means, Let Sam. me he tell it, Harry. It would take you all day. Uh, sorry, no offense. It's all right. Go ahead, Ray. Go ahead. Okay. Bella Kenwood is the biggest event of the year in the doggy set, okay? Okay. All right. Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten owns Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope. Real fine Scotty. Yeah, good tea, see? Hey, those pants are really gone. Anyhow, Harrison Kenworthy owns Lady O'Diddy's Rolamar Meme, Carrie Blue. Mimi. Huh? I'd get indigestion trying to say that other name. Okay, Mimi. They're two pretty good dogs, especially Mimi, international championship blood and all that. But Mimi's the better dog. Douglas won't stand a chance. I've tried to tell her this, but... Well, go on, go on. Okay. Harrison Kenworthy loves Kelly Van Pyten, see? Oh, loves her money. Him? He's loaded, too. No, I think the old coot really loves her, and I think she loves him. Right, Harry? Yes, I think I'm inclined right, to... Right, but now get this. Yeah? She won't marry him until her Laird Douglas beats his Lady O'Diddy, uh, uh Mimi, yeah. far and squar at the Balakinwood show. How do you like that? Are you kidding? Oh, no, John, it's an accepted fact. Right, that so what happens for over wait a year Wait a minute, now, Ray, wait a minute. If he really wants to marry her, why doesn't he just let her dog beat his? And let her be one up on him right from the start? Never. No, boy, he'd never live it down. You don't know these people. Well, this is about the craziest thing I ever heard of. To you and me, sure, but to them it's deadly serious. Are they in love with each other or with their dogs? Well, it's not just love where the dogs are concerned, but pride, which is just about all a lot of these old lonely millionaires have to think about, to live for. Yea, sometimes even unto the fifth and sixth generation. Yeah, okay, okay, I'll take your word for it. But now she said something about her dog being doped at the show last year. Oh, yes, John. You see, it was just a couple of days... Right, just before the finals. It was an attempt to murder the dog with poison. But emergency care both times pulled Lair Douglas through. She told me it was only some kind of a dope that oh, was used. Oh, sure, sure. We kept the truth from her. You don't realize it, boy, but if that dog were to die, she would. Fact. Oh, now, Ray. Oh, yes, John. And the insurance company must keep that dog alive in order to obviate having to pay off... Right. Yeah. <laughs> After all, her policies amount to a right. right. It may sound absurd to you, Johnny, but it's no joke. As I said, you don't know these people. But look, it still doesn't make any sense. You just have to take my word for it, and it's happened right here in Philadelphia. Yes, John, and we held the policy. It was an old lady. Right, named... so there you have it. <sighs> okay, okay, I'll, I'll believe you. And so the finger points at Harrison R. Kenworth. Well, she might like to think that, uh, especially since she doesn't know that poison was used both times, but I don't. What's more, the police feel the same. Oh, now, if you say police dogs, I'll slug you. John, there are times when the sense of right, humor Harry, of yours... Right, Harry, dead right, and I do mean dead. No, in all seriousness, Johnny, if I were you, I'd duck out of this assignment. Now, don't say that, Ray, unless John... No, 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 go, go ahead and say it. 
Something ought to start to make sense around here. All right, listen. The reason I'm sure Harrison R. Kenworthy had nothing to do with the attempted poisonings, the reason the police were called in, the reason I think you ought well, to you get, get out to of this... get to the point, Ray? On each occasion, Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten had a bodyguard attending Laird Douglas, in addition to the dog's governess and medicos and so get on. Get to the point. Each time, in order for the poisoner to get to that dog... Ray, please. Each time, the bodyguard was murdered. Still want this case, Johnny? <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, the joke's no longer a joke. Especially when a killer trains his sights on me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Lieutenant Steve Howard, homicide. I found word to call you there at your hotel. Right. I'm an insurance investigator, Lieutenant, and... Yeah, I've heard of you. Uh, can I help you? Well, I understand you're the man who handled a murder case at the Bala Kinwood dog show last year. That's right. Uh, we're still working on it. Oh, fine. Like to look over the setup for an attempted murder? Oh? Uh -huh. Who? Me. Stay right there, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account... America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote matter. And at this point, that name is no joke. Expense account item three, 70 cents, cab fare, from the office of Harry Branson to my hotel. It was at Harry's office that I got the craziest assignment I'd ever taken. Bodyguard to Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote, who turned out to be a dog. And I mean that literally. A purebred Scottish terrier who rated high enough and dogged him for somebody to make a couple of attempts on his life. Right now, it looked like somebody wanted me to be next. Uh, what's all this talk about an attempt on your life? Here, Lieutenant... Take a look at this handbag of mine. Huh? Wait, don't touch it. Huh? I left it here on this little luggage stand about an hour ago, right after I checked in. Only before I left it, I opened it and took out my gun. So? So when I got back, just before I called you, I found the bag as you see it now, locked again. Oh, well, now look here, Mr. Yeah, Dollar, I know, I know. But if a chambermaid had been in here, there would have been other signs. You know, bed turned down, fresh towels in the bath, things like that. Boy, you're a suspicious man. You sure you didn't lock it yourself after taking your gun I'm out? sure. Anyhow, instead of opening it, I started to pick it up to put it on the bed to unpack. Here now, you lift it. Why? Because it weighs close to 25 pounds, and that's too much for nothing but an extra suit, a few shirts and shorts, some handkerchiefs and the like. You check with the desk? No callers that they know about. Well, let me see. Yeah, that is pretty heavy. And it doesn't tick. Now, look here. Yeah? Do you see where somebody on the fire escape used a pry bar to shove this window open? Oh, yeah. And those marks are fresh. Very fresh. Operator, get me central police. Expense account item four. Check for $29.50 to the nearest Bond clothing store for one pair of trousers to replace those torn by Laird Douglas Douglas of what's-his-name when I'd first met him in Harry's office. Item five, phone call to Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. Well, don't you worry, Mr. Dollar. If you're delayed, you're delayed, and we'll just expect you here at the Maples when you get here. Your suite is all ready and waiting for you. I'll be there as soon as I can. Oh, I do hope you've had a suit made to replace those trousers little Laird Douglas tore. Why don't you have a couple of suits made and just charge them to me? Thanks. Maybe I'll get around to that. Goodbye, Mrs. Van Pyten. First of all, I had to know what Lieutenant Howard found out about the suitcase he'd had his lab crew pick up. I took a taxi to headquarters. That's item eight, 65 cents. Why, well, glad to see you, Dollar. Sit down. Well, what'd you find out? Dollar, that bag of yours had enough soup in it to blow out half the side of your hotel. 
Oh, and I was right. Yeah, professional job, too. Straight wire rig that would have gone off when you opened the bag. Brother, I guess my lucky star is in the ascendant. What made you suspect a booby trap, Dollar? Last year and a few days ago, somebody tried to poison a dog. Well do I know. Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote, Blue Ribbon Scotty, belonging to Mrs. Peter Malcolm, Malcolm Kelly. Kelly Van Fighten, yeah. Right. Apparently, the whole reason for it was to keep the pooch from winning the best of show at the annual dog festival, or whatever you want to call it, out at Balakinwood. So I've heard. I think it was more than that. Oh, wait a minute. Now, don't tell me you subscribe to the idea that if the dog were to die, Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten would probably kick off, too. No question about it. <sighs> okay. Well, you don't know her yet. You wouldn't be so skeptical. Her whole life revolves about that dog. And her money, of course. Now, from what I've seen, she just throws that away. Of course she does. At least in small quantities. You know, a thousand or two here or there, even a hundred thousand to some school or library or something where it'll show... But even that's only a drop in the bucket to her. Lieutenant, I don't quite see what you're driving at. Well, she is one of the remnants of a class in this country, fast dying out, thank goodness, that for generations has been cultured and conditioned into thinking that money is everything, that their whole destiny is to control vast industries, lands, railroads, oil, shipping, and people. People, Dollar, by means of their sheer financial prowess. But I thought our present tax Yeah, situation... sure, their day is almost done. But the few who are still around, like Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten, are hanging on for dear life, trying to add to their power. <laughs> hey, Steve, you make a sweet, gabby, eccentric old lady sound like an ogre. She is, no question. I'm sure she doesn't realize it. Simply because this whole attitude has been so thoroughly ingrained into her all her life? That's right. Oh, well, we'll see. Yeah, you'll see. Well, look, let's get to the point. Who do you think might be trying to get rid of the old lady... I haven't the least idea. Well, uh, no family? Relatives? Only living relative is her nephew, Warren Staley. Ah. Nothing. You sure? I haven't been able to pin a thing on him. Where can I find this Warren Staley? At the Maples. He lives there with her, huh? Yep. And you're sure he would be her only beneficiary? Yep. Uh-huh. Uh-uh. Good luck, Dollar. Lieutenant Howard seemed to know what he was talking about. Nonetheless, I decided that the nephew, Warren Staley, would at least be a start. And the sooner I could move in at the Maples, the better. Item 9, 780 cab fares back to my hotel and out to the Maples in the suburb of Germantown. When I first saw the place, I could hardly believe my eyes. It looked like a regular castle perched atop a small hill. Even the gatehouse, nearly half a mile from the mansion, was big enough to house several families. But the mansion itself, wow. Wow. A rather stuffy-looking butler, after practically climbing up my family tree, escorted me to the reading room. Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten, and guess who? <laughs> Whoops! Oh, easy now, Doug. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I'm so glad you're here. And look, he remembers you. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that sweet? Yeah, it is. Yeah, a boy, Doug. Easy oh, now. and please call him Douglas. Huh? After all, the name Doug sounds so common, doesn't it? Oh, you really think he cares, Mrs. Van Pyten? Uh, oh, you're joking, aren't you? Yeah. Mr. Branson said you had quite a sense of humor. Yeah, now, did Hastings show you to your suite? The butler? No, but he took my things. Then I'll show you. I'm sure you'll love it and be quite comfortable. This way, please. Yes. Uh, you coming, Doug? Uh, Douglas? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Attaboy. Attaboy. <laughs> Do you see how happy he is having you here? I am too, Mr. Dollar. Now we just... Oh, Warren, darling. Huh? Hello, Santa. Mr. Dollar, this is my little nephew, Warren Staley. Warren was 25 or so, bright, good-looking, and well, but comfortably dressed. And at Mrs. Van Pyten's orders, he took me up to my suite. Living room, study, breakfast room, bath, and bedroom. And it still occupied only a small part of the second floor. Now, here next to you are Dougie's rooms. One wow. for sleeping and one for eating. Can you tie that? The dining room for a dog. And uh, through that door is Mademoiselle Poirot, his uh, governess. She feeds and bathes them. And that's a full-time job? Oh, sure. Most pampered dog in the country. Brother, I'll go with you on that. No doubt Tonto will ask you to keep this connecting door open at night. Hey, sit down a minute, Warren. I'd like to talk to you. Sure. I hope you're impressed by all this. Are you kidding? <laughs> Tonto will love you dearly. Say, would you like a drink? There's a cellarette here for your convenience. Holy. Sure, scotch and soda. Good. Rather foolish, though, isn't it? All of it? What do you mean? Oh, it's such nonsense to keep up in a state like this just to keep face, so to speak. Well, she can afford it, can't she? Are you kidding? You sound as though you don't enjoy this life of luxury. Yeah, here's your drink. Enforced luxury to keep up the honor of the family. 
And I resent it. Oh. Without ever having to lift a finger, do an honest day's work. When she's gone, I'll be one of the wealthiest men in the country. That's bad, huh? Do you think it's strange that a fellow would like to stand on his own feet for a change, make something of himself, buy himself? Well, why not just pack up and leave? <laughs> you don't know Tata. No, I guess I don't. No, oh, it's really more than that. I'm the only member of this family left, aside from Tata. So I understand. I'm the only one left to carry on the Van Pyten Empire. They drink up. Wait a minute. Branson used that term, too. Yes, empire. Not only enough security to sink a battleship, but controlling rights in steel, utilities, and most important of all, East Moreland oil. I see. And what's most important about that is that I'll survive to keep control of East Moreland from Kenworthy. Harris and R. Kenworthy. Yeah. There's been a battle over East Moreland oil for, for generations between the Van Pytons and the Kenworthys. Say, tell me, does Kenworthy have any heirs? One. His son, Ronald. I see. What sort of a fellow was he? <laughs> Good friend of mine. We waste a lot of our time together. Oh, uh, drink up, Mr. Dollar. I'm ready for another, and you haven't even touched yours. Yeah, well, listen. I'm going to lay some cards on the table. Shoot. Sure. Somebody's been trying to get at Laird Douglas, the dog. Presumably as a way of getting at your aunt. It's true. If anything were to happen to little Dougie... Okay, okay. I'll take your word for it. Now, because of the intense rivalry between your aunt and Kenworthy... Or rather, between Laird Douglas and his pup, Lady Odidi's Mimi, or whatever her name is... Anyway, Kenworthy should be number one suspect. When you know him, you'll cross him off your list. So Lieutenant Howard has told me. But, uh, go on. All right, all right. As sole beneficiary of the Van Pyten Empire, as you call it, you come in as fast number two on the list. I can understand that. But unless everything you've told me is a fancy fairy tale to throw me off, then... Every... Everything I've told you is... It's true, Mr. Dollar. Hey, what's the matter with you? Nothing. Go on. Okay. And mind you, Warren, I'm not forgetting for a minute that there's been a couple of murders involved in this whole screwy business. Plus an attempt on my own life. Attempt on... on you... Dollar? Hey, hey, what gives you? <laughs> Are you plastering on a little over one no, drink? No, listen to me. I know. Now I... No, and I can tell you, Dollar. Tell me what? The answer. The, the whole thing... Dollar! Warren, what's the matter with you? I can't... I can't breathe. Hey, you... Warren! A, a drink... meant for you. Don't touch... He died without another sound. I carefully sniffed the drink that had been poured for me. Gingerly tasted it. Nothing. Nothing that I could spot. Yeah, poor Warren had probably been right... Whatever it was, had no doubt been meant for me. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, things and people finally begin to line up on the case. Just well enough for it to blow sky high. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Lieutenant Howard, homicide. Oh, hi, Steve. Hi. As you know, I've given orders for you to be confined to your suite out there at the Maples until I can get some of the lap crew out there. You don't think I murdered Warren Staley? Apparently, you were the only one who was with him when he died. Now, look here. I'm the one who's kept even the family out of here. What's more important, you're the only one on the whole estate who might be trusted to keep things intact. Any possible evidence. So please, don't leave your room. Okay, diplomat. I'll sit tight. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account, or rather report, submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in connection with my investigation of the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote matter. No need to itemize expenses at this point, because there are none. The magnificent suite in which I'm parked out at the sumptuous mansion of Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten is fine. 
Except for the body of young Warren Staley, Mrs. Van Pyten's nephew, draped over the arm of the easy chair in which he died a few minutes ago. I'd called Lieutenant Howard at homicide on the phone in my room immediately, and within minutes the nearest patrol man was stationed outside my door, refusing admittance even to the lady of the house. After all, this was the third murder that tied up with the Scottish terrier who started all this, Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote. While waiting for Lieutenant Howard and his crew, I shaved, showered, and changed my clothes. Then, about ten minutes later... Well, Dollar? Yeah, Lieutenant. Ah. See what you mean. Yeah. He seemed like a nice kid, too. He's all yours, Doctor. Go right ahead. Very well, Lieutenant. Here, Paul, just sit my kid. Okay, for pictures, Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, go right ahead, Sergeant. Okay, excuse me, Doc. Hey, before you get started... Okay, Dollar, let's have it. What happened? Well, Warren brought me up here himself, and I sat him down to ask him some questions. You suspected him, didn't you, in spite of what I told you? Sure. A sole beneficiary of the Van Pyten estate, empire as he called it. Yeah, well, what do you think now? That you were right, that he was clean. Anyhow... My boy, my poor darling Warren, where is he? No, take your hands off me. My boy Just a minute, is Mr. Dead. Van Pyten. You... No, you can't keep me out. This is well, my own house, and this is my own yes, nephew, I, I'm my sorry, boy. but you'll have to wait until we can get oh, everything clear. Oh, this terrible, terrible thing. Mr. Van Pyten, you'll just terrible. wait until we finish. Just this. a minute, Lieutenant. Hey, whoa, young fella, hold on a minute. Who are you? Johnny Dollar, who are you? Ronald Kenworthy, his best friend. What happened to him? He was Poisoned? Poisoned? And where were you? How could a thing like this happen if Whoa, you were doing... Oh, what... Ronnie, just calm down a minute. How long have you been here in the house? Why, half, three quarters of an hour, something like that. But I don't where? see... Where? Where were you? Well, I was down in the reading room with Mrs. Van Pyten. All the time? Len, out in the garden. Alone? Yes, except for a few minutes while I talked to Hastings, the butler out there. What were you doing in the garden? I was on my way up here by the back way to see Warren. I've always used the back staircase from the garden, ever since we were kids together. This suite of rooms used to be our playroom, ever since I can remember. All right, all right. Go on with what you were saying. Well, then about that time, or a few minutes later, I don't know exactly, I heard the police car come screaming up the driveway. That was the first that any of us, Mrs. Van Pyten or Hastings or I, that any of us knew that something was wrong, that something had happened to Warren. But now look here, Mr. Dollar, right, I don't... All right, you too. What? You'll have to leave with Mrs. Van Pyten until we're thrown here. Oh, please, Ronald, help me. Help well, me. but I... Go ahead, Ronnie, go ahead. Oh. All right. Oh, come on, you poor old... Ah, poor old dame. Sorry for her. You finding anything, Doc? Yes, I think so. I certainly think so. Be with you in a minute. All right. You better go on with what you were saying, Dollar. Well, not much more to say, Lieutenant. Warren felt the same way you do, that Branson at the insurance company does. If anything happened to the dog, Laird Douglas, it'd be the end of Mrs. Van Pyten. That the murders of the dog's handlers, caretakers, were purely incidental to attempts on the dog's life. But... But what? Well, he apparently was as concerned over this whole thing as we've been. Said he had a very strong theory about who might be back of all this. Who, did he tell you? He was about to, and this, whatever it was, hit him. Well, I'll tell you what it was, Lieutenant. Yeah, Doc? Oh, uh, this is Mr. Dollar. Oh, oh yeah, Mr. Doc. Dollar. Norfolk acid. Same thing that killed the two dog handlers and was used on the dog itself. I can tell without further examination... Wait a minute, I... Doc, wait a minute. If the dog got the same thing that killed a couple of grown men... A dog with a much more sensitive stomach, unused to all the strong food and drinks the human stomach is constantly abused with, a dog would immediately regurgitate and retain only a minute amount of the panorphic acid. I see. In the case of Warren Staley here, it was added to the scotch whiskey he drank. Traces of it in his glass and in a full glass beside your chair. Well, Doc, have you checked those bottles in the cellar, at? Uh, just about to. Uh, uh, which uh, bottle did he pour that out of, Dollar? The one right next to that bottle of VO there. He... Wait a minute. This isn't the same bottle. What? Well, the one he poured from was half empty. This is nearly full. Hey, now, what's the matter with you boys? Answer. You let somebody switch bottles a minute ago? Oh, you're such a thing. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Nobody else came in here besides Mrs. Van Peyton and young Kenworthy? Hastings, the butler, but he just stood in the doorway. That's right, Lieutenant. Yet somehow, between the time Warren Staley poured those drinks and now, somebody switched bottles. Unless you're wrong about this, Dollar. No sign of the poison in this one, Lieutenant. It's the only scotch bottle. You've been here in the room all this time, Dollar? Yeah, sure. And in the bath, I shaved and showered and dressed while waiting for you to get here. But only after one of your men came and parked outside the door. Well, where does this door lead to? Well, it's the dog's quarters. Two rooms. Oh, I see. Come on, Dollar. You might wait for us. Yeah, I'll be here. 
What about that door beyond? Oh, that. Mademoiselle Poirot, the dog's governess. Well, where was she? How should I know? I didn't even meet her. I... Oh, oh, oh. Scooby! Scooby! Ah, the Folies Bergere. Yeah, I, I guess I should have knocked. Who are you? Why you come in this way while I'm dressed myself? Uh, 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 sorry, mademoiselle. We're the police. Police? What have I done that you should see me this way? Well, nothing, ma'am. Nothing. But, but how long have you been there in your room? Only two minutes. I came in the back way to change my clothes. Yeah, that was obvious. It's my day off. I have big date. Well, not now you haven't. Get dressed and I'll send an officer in to escort you downstairs. Come on, darling. No, you cannot do this to me. I've done nothing wrong. You cannot make me stay here. Say, Pete... Send somebody around the back way to cover the governess and take her downstairs for questioning. Yes, sir. Hey, Ransom. Yo. And Johnny, looks like you goofed. Hmm? While you were showering, somebody came in through her room, through the dog's quarters, and did the bottle switch on us. Oh, well, then we're even. Yeah, we're... What? You have very carefully mussed up any fingerprints that might have been on those doorknobs. Oh. Uh... Jerry, see if you can get any prints off those doorknobs back there. Right. If I haven't wrecked them. But, Johnny, if I didn't know about you and your reputation, I'd peg this on you so fast, you'd... You haven't been holding out on me, have you? I assured him that I hadn't, then went downstairs to the monstrous living room and sat in while we went through a routine questioning of everyone in the household. I even went through the motions of bodyguarding the dog that had started all this and tried to console Mrs. Van Pyten. Results of the questioning? Nothing, Dollar, nothing. No leads. Yeah, so I noticed. The two previous murders of the dog's caretakers or bodyguards, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, well, same poison was used then. They had their food as well as the dog. But why? Why, Steve? Why? Why they? To keep them from helping Laird Douglas when it hit him? Well... More likely because those handlers had got wind of the attempt to poison the dog and suspected who was trying to do it. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah. So there's one thing you're overlooking, darling. What's that? The intended victim of this last poisoning was not Warren Staley, but you. Oh, brother, I'm not overlooking that for one second. Yeah, and that's why I asked you if you were holding out anything on me. Because it would indicate that you have a lead. Or at least suspicion about someone. Sure, sure, I got a lot of suspicions. Ronald Kenworthy, his old man, the butler, heaven help us, even Mrs. Van Pyten. <laughs> Maybe even you, Steve. But when it comes to evidence, uh... yeah, I know what you mean. Well, I've got work to do. Looking for the proverbial needle in a haystack was nothing compared to hunting for the poison bottle of scotch that was no doubt stashed away somewhere. Far, far into the night, a regular army of policemen probed and dug and poked around. They opened drawers and closets and cabinets, pounded on walls, looking for sliding panels and secret compartments, went through the trash, sifted a trash heap, dug up any freshly turned earth they could find on the grounds, even climbed trees. Yeah, they prowled through attics and basements, looked everywhere. Result? Nothing. Meanwhile, I stayed close to Mrs. Van Pyten, and I'll say this for her. In spite of her almost silly infatuation with that dog, she showed real strength of character. We sat alone together in the reading room. I know, Mr. Dollar, there's nothing I can do to bring Warren back. Therefore, there's no point in simply sitting here weeping over it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But it isn't easy because it meant more. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, um, uh, I want to ask you some things, Mrs. Van Pyten. I suppose this is the wrong time, but I... No, ask me, Mr. Dollar. I think I know what you want to ask, and now... Now that this last terrible thing has happened, I hope, I I pray that I can help you. Well, I had quite a talk with Warren before he died. Oh, oh, I'm I'm glad. Warren would have been the sole heir to the Van Pyten estate. Yes, he alone would have carried the honor, the prestige of the family after my passing... Oh, no. Surely you didn't think that he could have been behind those other terrible murders. Quite frankly, at first I did. But he told me something else, and it's bothered me. About Mr. Kenworthy and his son. Ronald? No, Mr. Dollar. He was supposed to be Warren's best friend. You said supposed to be. Well, I, 
I Warren don't... made it very clear that if the Kenworthys could somehow acquire the Van Pyten holdings, either by Mr. Kenworthy marrying you... I have told Harrison R. Kenworthy... Yes, I know. If Laird Douglas wins the show from his Kerry Blue Terrier, you'll marry him. Yes. And I still think it's a screwy idea. But the fact remains, it's fairly true. It's quite true. Neither you nor Mr. Kenworthy has too many years ahead, if you'll forgive me. Mr. Dollar, what... So there's now only one person left to benefit by the death of Laird Douglas, of Warren, of you, and ultimately of Mr. Kenworthy. Good heavens, Mr. Dollar. That's right. Ronald Kenworthy. Well? I know. I know it. I think you've said enough, Mr. Dollar. Ronald. Yes, I heard it all. Mr. Dollar, I think you've said too much for, shall we say, your health? Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, all cards are laid on the table. And believe me, the deck proves to have been stacked right from the beginning. Tomorrow, the wind-up. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ronald Kenworthy, Mr. Dollar. Good, I want to talk to you. Are you at your home? I am. And after the Okay, you... then stay right there and I'll be over to see you. Why don't you send the police instead? What's that supposed to mean? A few minutes ago in Mrs. Van Pyten's library, before you kicked me out, you practically accused me of the murder of her nephew. Did I? Well, didn't you? Didn't you? All right, Ronnie, just calm down and stay put until I can get over there. (laughs) You mean you aren't afraid I might try to take a powder, as you high-handed detectives like to put it? You mean you aren't worried that... Ah. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is the final report in my investigation of the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscoat matter. The whole case started out almost as a lark when I discovered that I'd come to Philadelphia to act as bodyguard to Laird Douglas Douglas and for a fat fee and virtually unlimited expense accounts. Me, bodyguard to a dog. But it ceased to be funny when I learned that the dog's two previous caretakers had been murdered. And when, only a few hours ago, an attempt was made on my life that ended with the death of young Warren Staley. Yes, Mr. Dollar, I see. I guess I was so upset by the death of my nephew that I I didn't realize the attempt was really made on your life. The second attempt, Mrs. Van Pyten. What? Shortly after I arrived in Philadelphia, somebody planted a booby trap in my suitcase in my hotel room. Good heavens, no. And you think that Ronald Kenworthy did that, too? Well, what do you think? Well, yes... Now that poor dear Warren is gone, there's nothing to prevent the Kenworthy estate from achieving control of the Van Pyten holdings. That is, if I were to die. Go on. Upon the death of Harrison Kenworthy, the whole financial empire would be inherited by his son, Ronald. So I understand. Ronald. And he would be the wealthiest, the most powerful man financially in the United States. Ronald, who pretended to be Warren's best friend who pretended to love me. It's a terrible thought, isn't it? Apparently adds up, though, doesn't it? There is no question of it. But what evidence have you? None yet. Well, then I'll help you get it. And I can do it, Mr. Dollar. I may appear to be only a wealthy, foolish old woman who dotes on her pet, Laird Douglas. But I'm not. I'm astute, shrewd, and clever. Since Peter, my husband, died, I alone have managed this estate, this financial empire. I use the word again. With my money, with my... Oh, yes, I can do it, Mr. Dollar, and Ronald will be made to pay for these terrible things that he has done. I, uh, I admire your confidence. Nothing. No one can stand in my way. You'll see. 
I'm only sorry that a few minutes ago you didn't keep him here, make him face it. I'm going to see him now. Oh, where? At his home. I understand the estate adjoins this one. Yes. But please, look out for him. Shoot first, Mr. Dollar. What? Because now he may act like the cornered rat that he is. I decided to walk across to the Kenworthy estate in the hope the fresh air would help clear my thoughts. Logical as it all seemed, I didn't like what i just heard. Then luck, pure, unadulterated luck. As I walked across the broad lawn between the main house and the gatehouse, I passed the garage building with its Rolls Royce, two Cadillacs, and a station wagon. And then I saw him. Andy LaFord, alias Andy Fortune, alias Andrew Ford, one of the cleverest second-story men in the country, with a record on the West Coast as long as your arm. A man who would do anything for money. He was idly going through the motion of dusting off a car. I walked past quickly, not sure whether he'd notice me or not. I hope not. For it was one of his ilk who'd had to plant the booby trap in my hotel room, who could have slipped the poison into the liquor that killed Warren Staley. I turned in at the gatekeeper's house. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I saw you at the quest. I want to telephone young... quick. Uh, well, you're uh, right here, sir. Is something Thanks. wrong? Thanks. Oh. Operator, get me central police emergency. Good heavens, Mr. Dollar. Something The man there happened? in the garage polishing cars. Uh, Andy? How long has he been here? Oh, a year more. Ever since the dog show at Valley Kid. Well, what does he do? Year. Oh, the driving for Mrs. Van Payton, but there's something going on. Hello? To... Give me Lieutenant Howard, homicide. <laughs> After warning the old gatekeeper that I'd have his head if he said anything to anyone about my phone call, I left by the back door and went over to the Kenworthy mansion where young Ronald was waiting for me. I must say, before we go any further, that I resent the way you ordered me out of the Van Pyten house a few minutes ago. Yeah? Well, I'm sorry. Whether you suspect me or expect me to help you in this case, it was Lonnie, hardly... you knew Warren Staley. Very well. We were the closest of friends. Confidence. All right. Just how much did he really care about the Van Pyten estate? Fortune, whatever you want to call it. To put it bluntly, he wanted none of it. And I'm afraid his aunt rather resented it. Well, why do you say that? Because her whole life she's been obsessed by an almost overwhelming lust for power... When Warren finally rebelled against this, she tried not to show it, but she hated him for it. Unlike my father. Oh? I feel as Warren felt. And my father and I together have been laying the groundwork for dissipating the Kenworthy estate into corporate setups that will benefit many instead of just us. Does that sound strange to you? Well, it sounds like true philanthropy, if you mean it. You must believe me, it is, and I do mean it. Oh, I won't suffer, of course. I'll still retain some control here and there, but I'll have to work at it instead of just carrying on the tradition of the idle rich. I'll be a man. I hope you're telling me the truth, Ronnie. I believe you are, and I'd like to meet your father. You will. Needless to say, it was much harder for him to break from this tradition of financial power than for me. So perhaps you can see why I admire him above all other men. Anything else? I'll see you later. I was worried about you, Mr. Dollar, going over there to see Ronald Kenworthy alone after all that has happened. Yes, you should have been, Mrs. Van Pyten. Especially if you noticed that I passed by the garage on the way. What? I happened to notice someone there, and I think it answered a lot of questions for me. It was Andy Lafort. Andrew? My private chauffeur? Is that all he is? Oh, do you know him, Mr. Dollar? Look, I took on this case, Mrs. Van Pyten, because you offered me a fee too good to be turned down and an almost unlimited expense account. You haven't answered my... I should have got wise then and there. But I thought your great passion for your dog was just an amusing foible of an immensely wealthy, kind of foolish old lady. Oh, Laird Douglas is a dear one, isn't he? Why, Mr. Dollar... Let me add things up. A few minutes ago, you told me that thanks to your wealth and a very sharp, clever mind, you'd let nothing stand in the way of anything you chose to do. Please, Mr. Dollar, I don't think I understand. All right. You made a contract with Harrison Kenworthy that you'd marry him when and if Laird Douglas beat that puff of his at the dog show... An apparently silly sort of thing, yet everybody believed it. But the real reason for marriage to him was solely to acquire control of his holdings, increase this financial empire of yours. Very subtle. Kept you looking like a cute, whimsical old lady. Why, this is the most absurd thing I ever heard of. So I thought at first, but let me go on. Oh, please do. When you realized that Laird Douglas wasn't ready to beat that dog of his... Rather than admit defeat, rather than lose the chance to make this marriage, you ordered the murder of the dog's handlers. Then the contract was still in force, just delayed. I won't listen to such terrible things. You'll listen whether you like it or not. 
You learned that Kenworthy and his son were planning to dissipate their fortune and thereby put it beyond your reach. Mr. Dollar... On top of this, your own nephew, Warren, wanted to do the same with your estate. This was too much. What you have said is too much. Then, by the time I arrive, you learn from an expert, Ray Rowland, that your dog would never stand a chance against Kenworthy's. So you wouldn't dare let him compete, at least until you'd hooked Kenworthy some other way. And part of your whole scheme was to build up evidence of attempts against you, through the dog, of course, though I'll bet you actually hate the mutt. No, that's not true. Anyhow, from the moment I talked to Ray Rowland, I was only in the way. So you tried to get rid of me, had somebody booby-trap my luggage. Oh, you have no proof. Andy LaForte, this so-called chauffeur of yours, would do anything for money. And I fully intend to break him down and make him admit you hired him as a killer. Listen. Listen to me. On the second try, the poison liquor, your nephew Warren got it instead of me. Fine, fine. Another obstacle out of your way. After all, he had opposed you. Mr. Dollar, how much do you want? I can make you financially independent. Then for you the rest set of... your sights on Ronald Kenworthy, who was trying to break up the other empire you wanted to get your hands on. You even hoped that somehow I might help you. Shoot first, you said. You don't understand. I was Just what only... plans you had for his old man and that warped, twisted brain of yours, I don't know. But I'm sure you had plans. Well, lady, now it's too late. No, Mr. Dollar. No, it isn't too late. Stay away from that drawer. You'd even shoot somebody down with your own hand if you thought it necessary, wouldn't you? But it isn't necessary, Mr. Dollar. Huh? Are you sure it wouldn't be easier if I were just to give you... Say, a hundred thousand dollars and two hundred thousand. All right, Andrew. Right here, Mrs. Van Pike. Well, well. Hello, Andy. Got a license for that thing? Shut up. You want me to do it now, Mrs. Van? Yes, Andrew. Uh, what if the servants hit a shot? Hold it, Donna. Don't worry, Andrew. I'll take care of things. Haven't I always for you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. She'll take care of things. While you're pulling that trigger, she'll blast you down so fast you won't know what hit you. Make it look like we killed each other and leave her in the clear. Quiet. She's got a gun in that drawer beside her and she'll use it. You hear me, Eddie? I said quiet. What you don't know is that she can't do without me. <laughs> but we can do without you. All right, Andy, wait now. Listen, will now, you? Now, Mrs. Van. All right, Andrew? Now. Thanks, Lieutenant. Oh, Lieutenant. Th then you saw he was going to shoot down Mr. Dollar. Yes, I oh, heard yes. too, Mrs. Van Pyten. Plenty. Oh, no, you, you don't understand. Mr. Dollar had come up here to talk to me. I wanted to offer him a great deal more money for his work for me. I guess didn't I almost I, didn't Dollar? make it. More Glad you keep I talking said. to him so then long. This Got a cough drop. The Is this body the end of the fortune? Oh, the shut the up. What was that? You heard him. I beg your pardon. Clever, shrewd, astute. You're just off your rocker. You'd have to be, I guess, to start a thing like this in the first place. Well, I guess by the time the estate and inheritance laws get properly applied, the Van Pyten Empire will be spread around the way Warren wanted it. Expense account item 10, $28.90. Fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Total, including fees, $1,113.40. Remarks? I'm glad I'm poor. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, an insurance swindle that really backfired. The only trouble was it caught me right in the line of fire. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in our cast were Jeanette Nolan, Harry Bartell, Byron Kane, Jack Crucian, Bill James, James McCallion, Ken Christie, Dick Ryan, Bert Holland, Jack Edwards, and High Everback. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.